Okay, let me get this prayer on. All right. So we, as always, just remind ourselves what we're doing here, not just think it mindlessly. We're we're set, we're setting ourselves in the right direction, kind of like, you know, stating our purpose. You walk outside the door and you say, "Where am I going?" So you don't just randomly walk. You decide to go to the ice cream shop or the park. Here, what, what are we going to do? What are we? Where are we going? Why are we here together? What's our purpose? Is to listen to these teachings so we can take some tools from it. So we can help ourselves develop our amazing potential so we can be a benefit to others. So if you'd like to make that the purpose of our little journey together, then think those thoughts and we'll sing a little prayer that expresses that. The, the last two lines express that. The first two lines are just reminding us of our reliance on the Buddha and his teachings. If we feel we're already Buddhist, then we can have that thought as well. So I'll, I'll say it in English the first time, just I'll put extra words in to really make it clear what we're doing. Then I'll sing it twice in Tibetan. So what we're saying is until we are enlightened, we are going to rely upon the Buddha, his teachings, and then the Sangha, the spiritual community. And then the second, the second two lines, by, so by the virtuous karma we create by listening to these teachings, may we become a Buddha so we can be of benefit to sentient beings, no matter how long it takes. Sangye charang choke chognam la jang cho baru dagni kyab suchi dagi chanyen gi sonam ki drola penche sangye drupa shok sangye charang choke chognam la jang cho baru dagni kyab suchi dagi chanyen gi sonam ki drola penche sangye drupa shok Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, good. So we can see each other. Okay, so we've been talking about this natural law of karma that as far as Buddha concerned, because he's observed it, he hasn't made it up. It's not from revelation. He hasn't just, he's not speculating. He didn't create an interesting concept and then plonk it on top of the world. What he's saying is this is what he's observed to be the natural law that runs the world. That's the best, the, the simplest way to hear it, you know? And because you see, because we've come from a tradition of creator religions, whereas the Tibetans haven't, then they don't sort of keep pronounce, they don't continually say things like that, but we need to say it continuously because we're so used to hearing kind of religious instructions as from on high and there's got a threat behind it, hasn't it? Because if you're naughty and you don't do it, you'll get punished. That is very in our bones. So I say this a million times for us to keep remembering that Buddha is not a creator. He doesn't assert a creator. We don't need creating. We do fine making our own mess. And fortunately, we can do fine creating our own enlightenment. You know, we're the boss. So this natural law of karma is such that every millisecond of what we think and do and say, every living being, every ant, every bug, every slug, every every monkey, all the and all the other beings we can't see, because there are trillions and trillions and trillions of mind possessors, sentient beings, as we translate, I'd much rather say mind possessor, trillions of them. And they're going back and back and back and forward, forward, forward. And the law that runs our minds, the law that runs our lives, the law within which our lives run is this natural law of cause and effect, such that whatever we think and do and say programs our mind. So seeds in our mind that will naturally, being seeds, ripen when the time is ripe, when the conditions all come together, will ripen as future experience. That's the essence of karma, really. That's it. That's it. That's the essence. That's the big picture. That's the concept. I mean, I think it's a great idea. I think it's marvelous. I love it. It's wonderful. I mean, you know, but what we do is we hear it as punishment. Oh, you mean I was a bad person before? We think like this. And that's the thinking that's not appropriate. Buddha's not teaching it like that. So we have to think about it, you know. So the logic is that if I'm in charge of my life and I'm the creator of my present happiness and I'm the creator of my present suffering, and then I check up, do I want suffering? No. Do I want happiness? Yes. Well, the, the you know, the, 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 the strategy is evident. Stop creating suffering and start creating happiness. I mean, it's all so simple, really, but we complicate it. And then, of course, because we hear it in 10th and 14th century Tibetan, you know, we don't talk like they do. So we kind of, it's hard to hear it, you know. Maybe it's hard to hear it in a 20th century Australian voice as well. Who knows? <laughs> okay. So we've been talking about how we create karma so far, and today we're going to talk about how we purify it. It's all part of the same process. You're creating karma, but it's a very specific approach, you know. 
So every millisecond of what we think and do and say so seeds in our mind that produces our happiness or our suffering. As we've discussed, there are four main ways in which our past actions ripen type of rebirth and within that rebirth let's say our human birth we've got the three other results of karma the kind of like the residual results the you know the tendency to keep doing it whatever it might be playing piano football or killing the, the experience of happening having it happen to you good or bad and the environmental results so to, to learn to begin to understand at least these four, it's a really powerful way to interpret the way our life is going and therefore to interpret other people's lives and therefore strengthen our aspiration to want to continue to abide by the laws of karma because I do not want suffering and I only want happiness. And like I've said many times, we don't, we get nervous saying something as blunt as that. It sounds like selfish, but we're missing the point if we don't get this first. The whole first level of practice, the first the, the level, the junior school and high school, I like to call it the lamb rim, the lower scope and middle scope, or the wisdom wing, is all the nuts and bolts of the practice of the of controlling your body, speech, and mind. Why? Because you, you are sick of suffering. That's what renunciation means. It means you're sick of suffering. You're up to here with suffering, you know. That's got to be driving you. Then compassion can add on to that. But we get we think, oh no, it must be for compassion. So we don't hear it properly, you know. And that means when we now start to do the purification, because of this, we don't also hear the purification practice properly either. So let's go into that. Lama Zopa says we're insane not to do this practice every day. And the logic is because every millisecond, it's just the way the universe is, every millisecond of your mind working, it's sowing some kind of seed or other. Until you're highly advanced, until you've realized emptiness at least, you, you know, you, you, we're, we're, we're locked into samsara, baby. And you know, the more we understand, when we start to start, when we study the mind, which is in the middle scope, the more we understand the depths and, pri and the primordial power of these delusions, in particular attachment, which is what drives our actions. I mean, they go profoundly deep. I always quote Lama Yes, he says, I can tell you about attachment for one whole year. You'll never begin to understand it. I and mean, it's not just like, oh, I like chocolate cake. That's the level, that's a gross level. It goes to sub. I mean, primordially deep levels. So we can't get there. You can't get to an advanced level before you get to the simple ones. So when we, the more we understand the power of attachment and, and aversion, which is the response when attachment doesn't get what it wants, and the more we understand the power of all the other delusions that come as a result of those and how they are informing the actions we do, the more, the more cautious we will be in leading our lives and the more we will want to clean up our act at the end of the day, do a bit of weeding basically. I mean, we know that gardens, just because you're asleep, it doesn't mean the garden goes to sleep too. I'm sorry. Seeds do their thing, you know? So we don't, I mean, when we, when we have this, this sense of that whatever you think and do and say produces the person you become in exactly the same way that we know when it comes to, to the body, let's say, which we're so obsessed with, that everything I put in this mouth produces the body that I will get. So, of course, we don't want to be overweight and sick and have diabetes and all the rest. So what do we do? We have some self-respect and we behave nicely now. We don't create the causes of future suffering. That's all karma is saying, but we can't hear it like that. We hear it as punishment. I mean, we've got to think about this, got to unpack the concepts, you know, unpack our own assumptions. This is the part of what practice is. So, okay, the, there's, there's lots of fours, aren't there? Well, here we've got the four opponent powers. And a nice way to remember them, I don't know where I got this from. I think it was my friend, a nun in Adelaide, 30 years ago, she called it the four R's. Maybe it wasn't, she, maybe she didn't invent it, I don't know. But it's a helpful way to understand. The four R's. And there's a different order, but this is, the, for me, the tastiest order. You know, honestly. The first one is regret. The second one is reliance. The third one is the remedy. And the fourth one is resolve. So now, now let's unpack these psychological states of mind, you know. Lama Zabrimache says regrets the, the most important because it's the doorway. Pabonka Rinpoche says the, the most important is the last one. And you'll, you'll see, you'll see the logic of this. Okay, so then... Um, there's lots of ways you can do this. You know yourself, you've probably got a sadhana that one of the lamas has written and has got you. Know, sometimes you do it more extensively with your bells and your, not your bells and whistles, but like your bells and your whistles, you know, and your, and your Sanskrit. And I think this practice is so important to do in the most simple words possible because, and, and it's like you 
talking to yourself. I think of this practice as being my own friend. Please hear this point, you know. And if you don't, I mean, when you get used to doing it every day, I mean, if you do it lazily, if you don't do it, you feel like a loss, you know, you feel like you haven't, the weeds are all out there growing. You don't want that. So the first step is regret. What's that? And this is the one that we really misunderstand, you know. Regret is acknowledging, saying, I did that. Okay, what we're acknowledging here, obviously, is the negative actions. Why? Because we don't want those seeds to ripen as my future suffering. And I mean, you know, you don't have to be a rapist or a terrorist to, to do negative actions. That's what I'm saying before. When you know the depth of attachment and aversion, you know, even the, the subtlest level of these still sow seeds of negativity. I mean, this sounds kind of cruel to us, but this is the logic of Buddhist psychology, the logic of the law of karma, you know. So regretting is acknowledging. So how about acknowledging things you did? The, so the, the first level of, of, of negativity, the heaviest negative, the heaviest level of negativity was expressed by the Buddha as his very first kind of like advice to give us. He exhorts us to not kill, you know, the seven, the 10 non-virtues, the first seven uh, actions of the body and the speech. So why are they heavier? Well, it's so logical because they harm others. The crucial point here is, is because they harm us. They leave seeds in the mind that are ripened as my future suffering. But they're labeled negative in this sense insofar as they harm others. That's not the definition of all, of all negative actions because the things that I do to harm me only are also negative actions and they will cause me more suffering. But the ones that harm others bring extra suffering because it's bringing in, it's, it's harming others. It makes it a thousand times more heavy. So the thing we start with by, you know, let's say, let's say we're Buddhist and we've taken the five lay person's vows and we're trying to live, trying to not kill, not steal, not harm, not bad mouth. And then, of course, as you learn to know your mind and you learn to understand what Buddha's getting at, you then start to realize, you, you know, Buddha doesn't say in the 10 non-virtues, don't eat too much cake. He doesn't say that. Cake doesn't care. He does it that relate to other beings, you know, but then you can start to understand because it's all about the actions you're doing that harm you. Killing someone else puts a seed in your mind that ripens as you being born in the lower realms, you having a tendency to kill, you getting killed by that person, karma's personal baby, and an environmental result. So the energy, the urgency behind this level of karma is for your own sake. Compassion comes second. You can't have compassion for others until you have compassion for yourself. And it's the best way to say what regret is. So you acknowledge, so you start with today, you know, you kicked the dog, cheated on your husband, bad mouth the next door neighbor whatever you know with our body and speech think about it and we might not do that much heavy negativity with our bodies but we, we love our speech that's our fact we're, we're fa we, we love speech we just vomit out whatever we feel so it's really important to you know to uh acknowledge those actions because i mean our culture we think speech oh, I'm a, i can say what i like we say we'd have no sense that negative speech is harming me, polluting my, my, my mind, distressing my mind, leaving imprints of those tendencies in my mind, and indeed polluting the, my body as well at a subtle level. The Vajrayana model talks about this. So, you know, we also know that even in a, even especially with, even if we're not especially, even these days when we're stuck in our house all the time, maybe not so much, you're still interacting with other people. And of course, it's, it's in relation to other people that we seem to have the biggest problems, isn't it? Sure, chocolate cake can be a problem. We understand that, alcohol. But the ones where we have all this stress and distress and guilt and all kind of knotted up inside is in relation to other beings, a mummy, daddy, husband, children, you know, next door neighbor, the politicians. It's humans that get us, isn't it? Or, the, or maybe the cockroach or the rat. So you acknowledge the things, I mean, just sort of you think of the things you've done today. I did this and I did that and I did this. So even to get to the point of being able to simply state it, this is already so difficult. Why? Because we misconstrue regret for guilt. And we love guilt. And don't blame your Catholic mummy or your Jewish mummy. Guilt is internalized aversion. You are the object. Listen to guilt. I did this and I did that and I did this and I'm a bad person. We, we do this utterly and automatically. You know, so what's anger? You did this and you did that and you did this and you're a bad person. So it's exactly the same state of mind, except you're the object. And it's, so regret is not guilt. Regret is also not, and this is something that's really, I mean, I'm shocked. I mean, 
basically a person who's even teaching Dharma had this misconception of regret as saying, I shouldn't have done it. That's anger. When your mother says, you shouldn't have done that. What do you think? She's, and she's having a panic attack because her fancy cup has been broken. It's her own attachment. She's not being wise. That's not, so we, but that's how we all ever hear it. We hear it as anger, pointing fingers, being critical, punitive. Regret is not like that. Regret is self-respect, just like if you realize that you know you've got an allergy, or you know you're allergic, you don't can't eat sugar, and you suddenly discover there was sugar in that cake. You might get some guilt, but I mean, really, it's oh my god, what a fool! I can't believe I just ate that sugar. Quick, what can I do about it? We know, we understand that is exactly the attitude of regret. Recognizing you did these dumb things that are polluting your mind sowing seeds in your mind that'll ripen as your future suffering and you don't want suffering. You're sick of this suffering. You're sick of all this nightmare. So it's a really healthy attitude, but you've got to cultivate it. It doesn't come naturally just by saying the words, I regret. You know, it's probably it's sounding like guilt. You're probably saying to yourself, I shouldn't have done this. This is meaningless. Now, the other misunderstanding of regret, and I find this really fascinating. I mean, I have long talks and I mean, it's really a struggle to hear this one. People think of the commonest response, and you might have this, some of you, so discuss it. You know, let's, for example, myself. Okay, I always use my example of my own abortion. Not everybody, I mean, lots of women have abortions, okay? So, of course, the Buddhist view is that the time that what made the egg and sperm in my fallopian tube come together and stay together and begin to develop into a fetus was the entry of a consciousness that had died a few days or weeks beforehand, a consciousness with whom I have a strong karmic connection. They made a beeline for that egg and sperm baby. So then from the second of conception by definition in general, that is the beginning of a person because the consciousness is there. It's a mind possessor. So when I, I mean, I was 20, I always tell the story and maybe I've told you guys and I don't want to make you embarrassed or anything, but I was 23. I was a hippie. I'd been a Catholic. I gave it up when I was 19, decided I prefer boys to God. So, that, you know, I went in the direction of boys. I didn't, I didn't have guilt. I never had guilt. Guilt was boring, you know? So it was just a clear decision. So when I was in London, 1968 in London, and the, I remember feeling very fortunate because the, uh, because abortion had just been, just been um, approved by the national health. So I felt, oh, aren't I lucky, you know? Because, yeah, and I always tell this story too. Many women tell me this. Many women say this. I knew that second I was just this particular boy. I remember the boy. I remember the place. I remember London, the time, exactly this person, whatever, you know, it's in your mind, my memory. And I remember I thought, oh, and I knew that second I was pregnant. Many women say that. It's very, because that's when the consciousness enters. I knew something had gone inside me. I knew it was as crystal clear as I'm lying there. I said to myself, oh, no, I'm pregnant. A friend of mine, her daughter and the daughter's husband were staying with, with the mother, my friend, while their house was getting built. And the daughter came down for breakfast. And the mother said, and, and the daughter said, oh, mom, I'm pregnant. And, and the mother said, oh, wonderful. When did you find out? And she said, 40 minutes ago. So she knew exactly, too. This is a very interesting point. All I'm doing is reiterating this Buddhist view that in general, that's when consciousness enters. So from that second, it's a fetus. It's a human being. So I always think of that, too. There's a boy. He didn't ever know about it. You know, I didn't care about him. The boy, this person who had strong karma with me, obviously with me. I mean, then he got to know the other one. This is the thing about the way to think about it, you know. So instead of just this guilt and the fear and the hiding and the that people do and holding it on and beating us up up with it, tortured. Like there's a friend I have now who's trying to get pregnant and she can't, and so she's totally destroying herself because she happened to have an abortion. So she can she's convinced that this is punishment, you know, for for her having an abortion, and she can't get past it. So it's really we've got to really look carefully in our thinking and try to make it accurate, you know. So this, 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 so this regret, so this, this abortion, there it was, a consciousness who died a few weeks before, a particular person who got the karma to be born a human. This is the way the four karmas ripen, you know, the way we talked before. So they got a human body. They won the lottery, not really winning the lottery, but they got a human body. But number two, the tendency to kill, well, they, we don't know. I mean, they got aborted at the age of 12 weeks, so there's no chance to know if they had a tendency to kill. But number three, the experience similar to the cause of killing, the person's past killing, they got the non-killing cause of their human body, but we've got millions of karmic seeds. But their particular killing karma was ripened as to be born to my wound that, you know, they, we had a strong karmic connection. And then I decided to kill them. 
I mean, you know, then I got the doctors and nurses to do that for me, you know, had the abortion. And even on that, I had to go back and have another DNC because they didn't pull out the poor little fetus properly. So that's extra suffering for the poor little fetus. I mean, I maybe hopefully the consciousness is gone by then. So then I think, okay, you know, I didn't, I didn't think of all this at the time. I'd been a Catholic. I didn't think of it as a soul. I didn't use that word. I just knew it was crystal clear. And that's how strong karma is sometimes. Between me and this consciousness, there was intensely strong karma. This is how it is with some people. You know, you, you've got some people you meet from the first second you cannot stand the sight of them. You, it's irrational, isn't it? There's nothing you can think that they did. That's the strength of the karma between you. How can people kill each other? I mean, the friend, I mean, so many stories. Pe all people who kill somebody are um, pedoph aren't, aren't, aren't psychopaths. Karma ripens. You walk, you you know, you're walking down the street and suddenly someone hits you. You hit them back and they die. It was the biggest shock to you more than anybody. That's how karma ripens. The seeds are there. So between me and that consciousness, there was this karmic connection, you know, and the strength of their past killing of me was a powerful cause for me to have this un, un, unquestioned decision. I will have an abortion. And then interestingly, you could even argue this, the, the fact that I was in London, where they did national health was free, you know, everything came together so easily to get to have this killing happen. That's the strength of the karma of this person. I don't know if it was a boy, boy or a girl. Their karma to be killed was so strong. There was not a single thing that hindered it. You know, it's very fascinating. This is how karma works. So the point is this. They, the strength of this person's karma was a major player in my decision to kill them. This is, this is dependent on rising. You know, if you've got the karma to make money because of past generosity, you, you just have to fill out a lottery ticket and you will win the million pounds. Not because you're so good, because the karma of your past generosity is so strong, you just choose a number randomly and you get a million dollars. It's not, it's not luck. It's the strength of your past generosity. On the other hand, if you don't have generosity karma, you can work 80 hours a week and never have enough money. So the karmic one is so powerful. So between me and this person, it was very clear. I knew they came the second they came into my womb. I thought, right, then I'm going to have an abortion. I felt so fortunate. I went to the Charing Cross Hospital. I met a doctor. I gave a reason. He said, okay, book me in, you know, went to the hospital. The nurses, they were so kind. And then because I got depressed, I don't, I don't get depressed normally. I didn't, I didn't know how to think about it all. They let me stay in the hospital for another week. They gave me my own room. They were so sweet. So I was so fortunate in many ways, but it was the karma to be killed by this. And the person created that karma. The fetus created that karma. So, you know, because we, we think we make babies, we take all the responsibility. That's just arrogant. That's just arrogant. If this person in my womb didn't have the karma to die, I, I would not have been able to have an abortion. We've got to understand this is how karma works. It's very interdependent. Not just me deciding, you know. That's what guilt is. Guilt says, I am so bad, you know. Our mothers had that. I, mean, I used to be go crazy with my mother and all her guilt. She had seven kids and we had a bit of a dramatic family like everybody, you know, my father wasn't the best in the world. And she took it all upon herself. I'm being a bad mother. I'm the cause of all the suffering. And I remember one time, even hard almost to articulate it. I was so mad at her that it's like insulting me as if I'm like this little infant who had no decision to ever in my entire life that it was all my mother's fault. I remember saying to her, you excuse me, mum, I made some decisions in my life. Don't you be so rude as say you're the responsibility for me. That's the arrogance about guilt. It over-exaggerates your role. It's neurotic and it's useless. Guilt is useless. My light keeps collapsing here. Guilt is just a waste of time. Guilt is just, I'm a bad person. Can you imagine if you just ate that sugar and you sit there paralyzed? Oh my God, I ate sugar. I'm such a bad person. I'm such a bad person. This is what this, my dear friend is doing. She can't get past that concept. I'm a bad person. I mean, that's just a demented thought. Do something about it, please. That's the point about re refuge, you know, um, regret. So acknowledging I did it. So now, now, this is the thing I was going to say before. Some people say, but why should I regret it? I did, at the time, that's the only choice I could have made. I always find it hard to even understand this thinking, but it's very common for some people, and maybe you guys have got it. What do you mean I regret it? Because we hear that as criticizing ourselves, you know? But that's like saying, well, I didn't mean to eat the sugar. Why should I go and do anything about it? I mean, that's kind of twisted. It's very complicated thinking, and it's got no logic to it, you know? 
It's due to my ignorance, due to the karma of this being who came to my womb, due to many conditions coming together, I got pregnant. So I had to take responsibility for my part of it. So at the time, I didn't know any better. It's true. So it's like you didn't know any, you didn't know there was sugar in the cake a week ago. But you, when you realize there was sugar in the cake, oh, I didn't realize. Oh my God, what a fool. Quick, what can I do about it? Well, I didn't realize back then when I was 23 or whatever. I didn't think about it, you know. And of course, in countless lives, I've killed countless beings. And we take the view that we've been animals in countless lives. And, and I mean, animals, just, that's their favorite activity, the poor things, out of their incredible fear and suffering. They live in kill or be killed, you know, because their fear is so tremendous. Their delusions are so tremendous. Their suffering is so tremendous. So, you know, you think about it. I've been a whale, one mouthful of one breakfast for one whale in her long life. She she in she she opens her mouth and in in go 40 million little baby creatures. Now that's very good at killing, isn't it? So we've done all this countless life. So get some perspective, you know. So you regret so, but you remember the actions you have done. You remember the ones, the ones you can remember, you 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 state. And then you think, well, I've done it countless times. So then you think, so what are you gonna do with this now? I'm gonna say, I regret that action from the depths of my heart. Why? Because I sowed seeds in my mind due to my ignorance. And I don't want those seeds to ripen. It's very simple. I don't want to get killed. I don't want to die. I don't want to have a tendency to kill. I don't want to be born in the lower realms. It's very simple, but it's so, it's kind of complicated for us. I don't want future suffering. So based upon my foolishness and my ignorance, I did that action. I regret it from the depths of my heart because I do not want future suffering. You've got to spell it out. And then, of course, you think of the other things. You kick the dog, bad mouth your mother, cheated on your boyfriend, whatever, you know, you, that you did to harm others. And then, of course, then you think, whatever I've done since the beginning of this time in all my countless lifetimes, because all these countless seeds are there in your mind, waiting for the conditions to ripen. There are trillions of karmic seeds that haven't yet ripened. So you, you better get them out real quick, babe. So because I don't want future suffering. That's the basis of regret, because I don't want future suffering. It's compassion for yourself. When you have it, when you understand this, it's called a completely different flavor, you know? It's kindness to yourself, based on the recognition that you produce yourself. So of course, if you've taken vows, you would be specifically, I regret having broken or weakened my vows, you know? And then you can think, of course, of your old rubbish habits, like, you know, um, things that just harm you. You can't control your eating, you can't control your drinking, you can't control your porn. The things that you know are harming you. No, 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 no need for guilt. Who wants to keep who who wants to keep growing their attachment? Nobody. It just makes us more distressed. It's not being moralistic, whether it's cake or pornography, it just increases your suffering. That's all. So it's again kindness to yourself. Recognizing this is where you're at, but you've got to sort of start to attack it, you know, in a healthy way. Like you might be in the middle of being an alcoholic. You got to start somewhere, the beginning of the thoughts to sort of move yourself slowly out of this nightmare. You got to start somewhere. So you think, I do regret from the depths of my heart, the dumb things that I do to myself, the overeating, the this and the that, and the, the you know, the, the video games. I mean, I hear about video games. It's like, it's just like pornography, you know, five hours, six hours, seven hours a day. People can't resist thinking about it all the time. That's what attachment is. You think about the thing all the time. So it's so distressing for our minds, attachment. So you can think of some of your own rubbish actions, you know, I regret because I don't want the future suffering. Then you think next step, whom can I turn to? Where's the doctor? Quick. Now, this is where it's hugely different also from Christian teaching. You've got to think of this one if that's been your past. It's distinctly and profoundly different. So when I'm a Catholic, I had to, I do re the regrets like the first. I'm confessing to God, confessing. Here, you're not confessing to Buddha, really. You could if you've got a very close, you know, you're going to visualize Buddha in the next step. We're going to go there. In this step we're getting to now, we're going to go to the Buddha. But really, I like to think of this practice as you talking to yourself. It's not just some holy thing, please, Buddha, forgive me, because that's the point. If I'm a Christian, by definition, purification is God's forgiveness. That's it. And without God's forgiveness, you are lost. This is completely not the Buddha's view. This is such an important point to think about, please. I mean, Buddha is a nice person. Of course, he'd forgive you. But that for the Buddha is like asking your doctor to forgive you for eating sugar so you don't, and so you don't, so you get off the hook and don't get diabetes. 
I mean, you, people would laugh at you for such a childish, childish attitude, you know? Of course, your doctor will forgive you, but you, you still got to stop eating sugar. You still got to purify your own body. Same here with negative karma, you know? This is your mind we're talking about. You can rely upon the Buddha, and indeed, the second step we will, I'll describe. But not as a not as a not as a not as a forgiver, not as a person who's going to get you off the hook. And that's just an interesting point here. I want to mention. We find it very powerful in our lives. To, you know, the, the business of um, re, uh, per, um, what did I just say? Forgiveness. It's, it's marvelous to forgive. Like if you've hurt somebody, it is excellent to to you know, like you should. You go through the first step. You'd regret because you don't want the suffering. That has to be the first one. But we usually skip over that because this is our boyfriend and we've been mouth mouthing and we had a big fight and we're going, you know, he's going to work one way. I'm going to work the other. And I'm freaking out completely because I'm terrified he's going to give me up. So out of my guilt and neurotic and fear of him rejecting me, I'm going to call him up. Please. I'm so sorry, John. Please forgive me. I really do love you. I'm so sorry. And I'm desperate to wait to hear those words. It's all right, Rabina. I still love you. And you go, phew, off the hook again. So we misuse forgiveness, you know. It's like, and as other words, I've got the bad, bad mouthing John, and then I'm using John to get me off the hook. This is very wicked. If he were really my friend, he would say, "I'm Rabina, I'm happy to forgive you, honey, but if you don't, you need to make a decision to change." Because the thing is, if you don't make the decision to change, which is the fourth step, nothing will change. Nothing will change, and then forgiveness just isn't enough because it doesn't help you. You still got the habit, you know, and it's just attachment to reputation that you just fixed. So it's very, very, very tricky, you know, this one of forgiveness. And of course, if you feel you need somebody's forgiveness before you're going to feel better, and let's say, you know, like my friends in prison who've killed somebody, the person's dead, they can't forgive you. So no wonder they get depressed and think, well, I'm just going to go to hell, why bother, you know, and they want to kill themselves. And this is the point about, let's say my boyfriend doesn't forgive me. Then where am I left? And this is this is our tragedy because we're so junkies, hungry for the approval of other people, hungry for their approval. We assume that if someone approves of me, that means I'm an okay person. If a person doesn't like me, if John doesn't forgive me, that means I'm a bad person. That's how we define ourselves. So we have these really terrible mistakes in our mind, you know, R wrong assumptions. So this one is a, a very powerful practice where you are the one who's forgiving yourself. You are the one who's purifying. And even if you, you know, the six people you've harmed all refuse to forgive you ever again, it does not mean you can't purify it. I, I can't stress this enough. And Buddha's role is not to forgive you. Not in these kinds of actions, natural actions, natural laws, you know. But what do you do with the Buddha? What's Buddha's role? Well, this is the second step, reliance. There are two parts. So the second part, the first part is where you, you know, we, we all, you, you know, you know, if you've done this practice at the center, the, it, among all the Tibetan lamas, they love this practice most of all. It's that one that's said to be the most potent, the most powerful. And in general, the practices we do, the meditations we do that involve the Buddha, any Buddha, because of the, po the power of Buddhas, the power of enlightened mind, just by bringing them into the mix makes the practice very powerful. So here, the, the way we do this practice is in the framework of um, um, a, a, as a meditation. And the second step is, well, whom can I turn to? Where's the doctor? Because that's your relationship with Buddha as a doctor. Whom can I turn to to give me the methods that I can use to heal myself? That's the approach to the Buddha. So here we visualize Vajrasattva. Vajrasattva is, is, is in the tantric aspect of the Buddha, not like the one behind me. And he's, he's particularly, he's a, he's, a, he's a white version of Vajradhara, who is the main Buddha in Tantra, for the Guru, at least in our tradition. So it's the tantric aspect. So then Vajrasattva is particularly powerful for purification. I think it's got to do because he's related to emptiness. I don't, I'm not quite sure. I mean, they all are, but because it's finally when you realized emptiness that it actually you purify. Until then, you're just putting atomic bombs under the seeds, preventing them from growing. You won't rip out the seeds until you realize emptiness. So here you turn to the Buddha. So then, you know, if you've got a Buddha, if you, you, if you like the Buddha, if you rely upon Buddha's teachings, and it, particularly if you've got a person in human form who you decide is your spiritual mentor, your guru, your person heavy with qualities, your lama, then it, it, we need, I mean, we all are very fragile and we need support. So it's very powerful in your mind to turn to the guru Buddha, you know?
above your head. So you visualize Vajrasattva above your head. And if you have a guru, you think it's their mind manifesting as Vajrasattva for your benefit. So you just, you know, this is the second, this first part of the second step of reliance is the first part is refuge. So you just, you can say a little refuge prayer there. But for me, to make it, for me, I want to make it just really real, not just reciting words mindlessly. So for me, the real point here is like, can you imagine? If you've got some incredible disease and you you or you you know you've eaten some poison, then I always use the example of eating poison, then you're going to be frantic, aren't you, to find a solution? So if you find a doctor who's got the antidote to your poison, think of how you'd feel. You'd be over the moon. You'd go to you'd go to you'd go to well, where is it? when I'm in Europe, I say you'd go to Tasmania, and when I'm in Australia, you say you'd go to Iceland. So you're about in the middle somewhere. Now you probably got to go to Tasmania. You've heard of some doctor in Tasmania who's got the antidote. Honey, children, I'll tell you, you would find even a first-class ticket and you'd get there. This is the attitude of regret, of, uh, of reliance. Not, oh, I take refuge in the Buddha, blah, 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 you know. You're so happy to have a doctor. Why well, do so many of you look like fucking hippies? Oh, sorry, darling. Yeah, we are a bunch of fucking hippies. I agree with you. Goodbye. Go away. You're a silly man. Excuse me. It was the second time in a year I've ever had that happen. So it's not that often. I swore too, didn't I? Just like him. <laughs> I'm trying to have a Rubina. I'm trying to work out who that was so I can remove oh, them. Oh, how can I know? We can't possibly know. It's one of these people who's bombarded. People get in, don't they? I've heard about it. I've no idea. Just ignore it if he comes again. Okay. And if he, if he comes again, we'll just uh, turn off and start again. Don't worry about it. So um, maybe he got nervous because I swore back at him. Maybe he's there listening now. Go away, you silly man. Or listen and be quiet and you might learn something. Okay. So reliance is this kind of delight that you found a person called the Buddha who's got techniques that you can use to purify your negative karma because the fundamental logic of karma being an being natural law of cause and effect and impermanent, there's no karma we can't purify. See, this is the most devastating suffering we have in our culture, this terrible, unbearable guilt. And then we build that story up until we have no choice but to kill ourselves. You know, it is just unbearable. Because we are, this is the, the tragedy about the delusions. All delusions exaggerate the object. So here, guilt exaggerates. There we go. No problem. It's just obstacles. Don't worry about it. Pay no attention. So it's really, you know, so this, is the, this is the one where we have to understand there's no karma we can't purify because it's a dependent arising and the dependent arising means nothing set in stone. And the tragedy is, like I said, the function of all the delusions is to exaggerate. So guilt exaggerates our badness to the point where we totally believe that I'm just evil in my nature. This is the worst tragedy in our culture, you know? So this, that's why this should be a very energizing practice because there's nothing you can't purify, but you've got to think of it in the right way. So the second step is you should be so delighted to think you've got the Buddha, you've got the, the techniques, you know? That's refuge. And the second part, under the heading of reliance, is um, under the heading of reliance, the second part is now where you have compassion for others. So, it's, you know, it's kind of, it's the first thing is, well, what do you mean it's called reliance? Why is compassion under the heading called reliance? Well, I'll explain. There's a particular approach they have. My light just keeps collapsing and poor Buddha's in the dark. I want you to see Buddha there just for a bit. What to do? It keeps falling. Never mind. So, okay. The whole way they talk, you know, in the Bodhisattva path is that you're trying, you, here we're now trying to have compassion for those we've harmed. So why do we call that reliance? Well, it's very simple. If you want to develop compassion, compassion is empathy with the suffering of others. And you want to be really, that's the driving force of the Bodhisattva path. So if you want to cultivate compassion, what if you never met a suffering person? What if you never met a suffering person? Think about this. Think about it. What if you never met a suffering person? You'd never get compassion, could you? Think of it. It's very logical. So in that sense, we need to know about suffering people. We rely upon knowing about suffering people. That's the, that's the concept behind it. Without suffering people, without seeing suffering, that's why the body suffers. Don't want to rush off into the mountains and disappear. 
They want to come down to the smelly old cities like Leeds and London and everywhere else. Leeds is hardly very smelly, but probably a little bit baby. Not like London. Big fat city where all the crazies are. You know, the bodhisattvas love the crazies. It's grist for their mill. So you, in order to get compassion, you need, you need suffering sentient beings. So in this second part, you now, now have compassion for the baby I aborted, for the boyfriend you cheated on, the rat you killed whatever it might have been, and all the other actions in countless past lives, all the trillions of sentient beings you've eaten, harmed, abused, raped, tortured, you know, in all countless past lives. Think of all suffering sentient beings whom you have harmed, meaning whom you have created a karmic connection with. Oh my Doesn't matter. Ignore it. Just let it be, Sarah. Doesn't matter in the slightest. Um... Do you understand so far, people, what we're talking about? You get the point. So the first one is regret is specifically like compassion for yourself. You're owning responsibility. You're recognizing the dumb things you've said and done in countless past lives. You're sick of this suffering because you know that these seeds are going to ripen and you have you regret from the depths of your heart because you do not want future suffering. That's the attitude of regret to cultivate. Not guilt, not I shouldn't have done it, nothing like that. It's kindness. You know, then the second step, you're so relieved to find the Buddha, you visualize the Buddha, you take refuge, little prayer, or you just delight you've got, got a doctor. Then the second part, you think of the particular sentient beings. You know, you can think of some. I mean, there are trillions we've harmed. You think of just some the boyfriend, the rat, the baby, different ones. In, in, and you think, now I regret for their sake. I must purify for their sake. And you think, you think, you know, you have to own the responsibility. You did harm them, even if they harmed you more. This is part of the problem. What do you mean, have compassion? He harmed me more than I harmed him. You've got to take responsibility for your part of it, you know, your part of it. So have compassion for this person. Now, if you can, if you're brave enough, you also have, <coughs> you also have compassion for those who, you, who, who have harmed you. This is the most powerful. This is intense. And if you can't do it, don't go there. If you've been abused by somebody and you still haven't gotten over it, then leave it there. But if you can, and what is the what is the logic of that? And that's why getting to the compassion practice is impossible until we've understood karma. This is very, very logical. It's not, well, I mean, it's worth talking oh about. God! What we have to just accept. Just it's good to practice patience, people. Just ignore. It's like a it's like a, a dog's barking outside. Okay. Like a bunch of uh, any, it just doesn't matter. Just don't worry about it. Now I forgot what I was saying. What was I saying? Which step was I up to? Yeah, okay. Let's talk about for a second why the understanding of karma for ourselves is crucial in order to have valid compassion. This is not the to this is not the topic of karma, but it's very important to understand this. So compassion, what's compassion? This is the more advanced teachings. As the Dalai Lama says, compassion is not enough. You need wisdom. And this is all the work of the wisdom wing. Junior school, high school, understanding, understanding your visions, understanding your suffering, understanding your suffering, being sick of your suffering. So then, so that means, of course, you're in the Four Noble Truths, you study the first one, and there are three kinds of suffering. The first kind is the suffering of suffering, which is when the bad things happen. That's understandable. But the second and the third are more abstract for us and very hard to get to. But when we can begin to understand, so the second one is, the, is, is called the suffering of change. So what does Buddha mean by that? Well, it's very depressing. Buddha means what, by that what we mean by happiness. We, what, what we think of in life, there's two things. Suffering is when attachment doesn't get what it wants, which is the bad things. And happiness is when attachment does get what it wants because attachment runs the show. Attachment is this default assumption deep in our bones that we only must get the nice things to happen and we do not want the bad things to happen. That's the only way we think of suffering. But Buddha's got a more nuanced, subtle look at suffering. He says, even what we call happiness, which is when attachment gets what it wants, that's a subtle, more pervasive level of suffering because it doesn't what the happiness the happiness that does come I mean, this is not technically you got to think about this so what even what's happiness for a second let's discuss this. when you study the mind in the middle scope you know you um 
you learn about the positive states of mind, the negative states of mind, and the neutral states of mind, or I prefer to call them the mechanics. And there's these very distinct, I'm sure we've talked about this, very distinct characteristics. This is kind of unique to the Buddha's view of the mind. And, we, and if we don't understand this, we don't understand Buddha's view of the mind. If we don't understand Buddha's view of the mind, how can you give up attachment, for goodness sake? How can you get liberated? It's not possible. So there's one state of mind in the third category, the mechanics, I call it that. And these are, these are states of mind that are neither negative in their character nor positive in their character, but they're crucial nevertheless. They're good. You need them. Concentration, for example. The word mindfulness, we use it in lots of ways, but it really is simply referring to this very specific state of mind that is the ability to not forget what you're doing moment by moment. Well, as Lama Zopa says, thieves need mindfulness. But when we hear that word mindfulness, we hear it as a virtue because we put all these extra bells and whistles on it. I remember one person at, at one teaching left because he was so insulted. He thought I was insulting Vipassana meditation or something. No, I'm just using Buddhist psychology here. So there's many of these states of mind, concentration, good memory, discrimination. There's many of these without which you'd be a senile person. You couldn't function. So whether you're a murderer or a meditator, you need good concentration. You need mindfulness. And we don't hear it the way we hear it. You need, you need a good memory. You need discrimination because you might murder the wrong person. You need all of these parts of your mind that I like to call the mechanics. Now, what's fascinating in that third category, one of those states of mind is called feeling. You hear it in the five in the five aggregates. Buddha talks about, about it all the time. Feeling. So what does that mean? Well, for the Buddha, it doesn't, it's not an equivalent of an emotion. Not the way we use this word. It's very precise. There are only three kinds of feelings. Pleasant feelings, unpleasant feelings, neutral feelings. Well, let's forget the neutral. They, they do exist, but we just don't even bother with those. All we are concerned with, is it not, are the pleasant ones and the unpleasant ones. But well, what are other words for those? Well, guess what? The word joy, the word happiness, or the, even the more extreme words, you know, bliss, ecstasy, rapture. They're all variations on a spectrum of mild to intense of happy feelings. Now, these are not delusions, but our trouble is because we understand attachment is a, is a negative state of mind, but we conflate it with, with pleasant feelings. We're so confused because we haven't studied the Buddha's view properly. As Lama Zopa says, when we hear the Buddha says, sorry, guys, you've got to give up attachment, we go, oh, I've got to give up my heart. I've got to give up my happiness. No, because we haven't studied Buddha's view. Feeling, happy feelings. Lama Yeshi would say, the more pleasure, the better, dear. Because he said, you pathetic hippies, well, he didn't say pathetic, he was always so kind to us. He says, you don't even know how to be happy. You, you love to be miserable. We're full of guilt and neurotic, aren't we? All of us. So feeling means happy feeling. And then the suffering feeling, there's only two kinds. So now attachment's job, the junkie in us, is to get the object that we believe such that when we have contact with it, pleasant feelings are triggered. Think about it. Think about really attachment. We can say we're attached to chocolate cake. But if you just sat there watching the chocolate cake, you wouldn't be satisfied, would you? You've got to put it in the mouth. Why? Because you want a pleasant feeling. So we all are hungry for happy feelings. We are hungry for happy feelings. So the only method we know in this samsaric body of ours this is the subtler level of suffering the Buddha's talking about. The only way we know how to have any pleasant feelings generally speaking, look at the world, is to get an object of the five senses. Think about this. No wonder we're junkies. Now, Buddha happens to say, this is why it's marvelous to read the books like Lama Yeshi's Mahamudra, when he talks about the marvelous natural qualities, the natural potential for unbelievable bliss and joy and happy feelings that our minds just naturally possess that we can access when we get developed single point of concentration. It's just natural, but we don't know how to access it. So we have to have eat cakes and have boyfriends and watch porn and, you know, or every single tiny thing we do. So when we begin to understand that attachment and how it causes suffering and how it doesn't, it does bring happy feelings. This is true. So, okay, Buddha's not arguing. The cake, there's the cake. Your mind's thinking about it. You're you, you know, you're dissatisfied. Oh, what's missing? You know, that's dissatisfaction. Then you think of the cake. 
and you get all excited and the anticipation comes and you get the cake and all all this procedure making it buying it is to get it on the plate then to get it in this mouth here isn't it that's the whole that's the goal the purpose of the whole thing so what once you put that in the mouth and if your stomach is nice and empty and the cake is but you know things come together you will go oh that's so delicious and it is delicious you did just experience a pleasant feeling. Fact. Buddha does not argue with you. But what he is saying is this, and this is tr this is scientific truth, but we can't bear to hear it. We think Buddha is just being punitive. No, he's just pointing out facts. And this is why we have to really analyze the process of attachment, really look into our minds deeply. You know, what happens is you're dissatisfied which is a function of attachment. Then you think of something, so you get all overexcited and you anticipate it's a function of attachment. Then you manipulate to get the, the cake. It's a function of attachment. Then you put it in the mouth. Oh no, then attachment is painting a picture of that cake on that plate like you can't believe. It's like you, it's look, it looks like divine to you. That's made up by attachment. It's made up by attachment. And you listen to this as proof. So you're so excited, so anticipating. It looks so divine. You can't believe it. There's no control. In the mouth it goes. So then, and it's blissful. But what happens? Even as you're chewing that first mouthful, already you're, dis you're dissatisfied and already you're thinking of the next mouthful. Because one of the most, you know, the, the simple function of attachment is we can't, we can't be satisfied right this second. We're always anticipating something, never satisfied with what we've got. Millisecond by millisecond by millisecond, we are dissatisfied. So that first mouthful is probably the best. It's going to be downhill from there. But, and you'd think that would be enough. That bliss is the best bliss I'm going to get. What a delicious mouthful. And you leave it there and enjoy it. No, we're not satisfied. So you want another mouthful. And the belief is, the anticipation is, the, oh, the next mouthful will give me pleasure. The next, no, satisfaction, meaning you'll be content. Contentment, you'll be content with it. But, so you have a second mouthful, and then a third, and then a second piece, and a third piece. Now look at the process of what happens. This is scientific fact, not religion. Gradually, we know the cake through your, you know, the cake starts to appear to you as not so delicious. The taste is nowhere near as delicious. The pleasure is nowhere near as delicious as the first moment of the first pleasure. And soon it will, this, this, this pleasant feeling is already going downhill and is inexorably and shockingly turning into unpleasant feeling. And that's when you go, oh, I better stop eating, otherwise I'll vomit. There's not a single sensory experience in the universe since beginningless time that we've ever had that isn't, that is based on attachment that isn't like that. We, we're never satisfied. That's the disease of attachment. We are never satisfied. So the point, the real point I'm getting at here is this, that, that the attachment is one part of your mind and feeling, pleasant feeling is another, but we conflate them, you know. Why did I even bring up feeling in the first place? For some reason, compassion. Oh yeah, the different levels of suffering. Okay, that was to help us understand the second level of suffering. So even when you understand the second level of suffering, which is when you get the happy things, when you start to realize that and you get renunciation, then you have a basis. If, if you only realize suffering is when the bad things happen, then naturally the only people you're going to have a compassion for are the, are the victims of abuse or the victims of starvation or the victims of wars, the people who have got the suffering of suffering, you know, and they have to be innocent victims. I'm sorry. If they deserve it, then they deserve it, <laughs> you know. So maybe a few animals and a few children we have compassion for. But if you're a bodhisattva and you've understood the three levels of suffering, you have unbearable compassion, as Lama Zobra says, for every single sentient being, and you have even more for the for the for the naughty ones, because they are driven by such intense delusions, driven by heavy negative tendencies, with no control whatsoever, and are creating unbearable countless lives of future suffering for themselves. So they're the ones who deserve them. So the bodhisattvas have more compassion to them. So that you could never have that in a million years if you haven't understood karma and you haven't understood the Four Noble Truths. Just not possible. Impossible. Impossible. See, you know, karma, but so karma starts with yourself. 
you've got to have your no, know your own suffering. Be sick of your own suffering and want to get the hell out. Okay, so the third step is the remedy. You apply the remedy now. So in this particular meditation, it's a visualization and the recitation of Vajrasattva's mantra. So here we go, oh, this just sounds like religion. How can me imagining Buddha and nectar coming and saying some Sanskrit words, how can that purify me? It just sounds so ridiculous, you know? Well, the more we understand karma, the more we understand the mind, the more it's logical that it will. As Lama Yeshi says, we create negativity with our mind. So we purify it by creating positivity with our mind. It is our mind that is doing this process. So the more you engage your mind in this compassion, in the regret, and now the third step of visualizing the Buddha, imagining the nectar, wanting to purify every atom of negativity, saying the syllables, knowing you're blessing your mind and blessing your wind energy and purifying your body, speech and mind. You say it with confidence, you know. The third step, this particular approach to it. The fourth one, the Bonka says, the most important. That's res the resolve, the determination to not do it again. That's the thing about, you know, 14 times I've asked him to forgive me and I've been always bad mouthing him. And, you know, until I make a decision, I will not bad mouth Tim again, or I won't bad mouth Tim for 24 hours or even 10 hours, you know? Because if you don't make a decision, you don't do it. If you, you have to, it's so obvious, it's so like ludicrously obvious that when you decide to do something, that's what the meaning of intention is. Intention is, the, is, is in that third category of states of mind. It doesn't mean motivation. Intention is bare bones volition. I will. This is the real meaning of karma. The real meaning of karma is mental action. And that is this word intention. I will. Whatever it might be. And then it's driven by a motivation. So deciding is intending to do something. You won't do it if you don't intend to. You won't go to the shop and buy ice cream if you haven't intended to. It's a really powerful concept. This is the meaning of karma. That's what drives everything. So you've got to make some decisions here. Maybe I've been bad-mouthing Tim for 25 years and it's too hard to say I'll never do it again. So I really am taking responsibility now. And I will go maybe, and I'm doing my meditation at 10 at night. I can even say I will not bad-mouth Tim for 10 hours. And I will keep it because I'm asleep. I'm not joking. You give yourself a timeline. You, you, and this is where you get courage to know that you can change because you are taking responsibility. Now, if you have guilt in the beginning, you can't do any of the future steps. You just stay there poisoning yourself with guilt. You can't move forward. This is the most powerful one and gives you confidence. And don't, don't be surprised. The next day, I will leave, give Tim some peace, you know, because you decided. So we've got to have confidence in our own mind, our own power. Realizing the power of decision, intention, I will. It's logic. So you make some decisions. If you've taken the lay vows, you will reiterate those vows. I will never kill. I will never steal. I will never lie. And that what you're doing, not just you're not just kind of wishful thinking. You're digging that groove ever deeper in your mind. It's like every time you do another push-up, you're getting stronger. Well, here you're strengthening your decision, your vows to not kill, lie, steal, etc. So purification combined with vows, these are the most blissful tools you could ever have. They're the best tools in the world. You can sit back and relax and watch pop, watch television all day. Live in vows and do your purification at night. I'm not joking. Sitting there watching your breath for one hour a day, but doing nothing else, you, 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 you're taking one step up and 20 steps down. You know, there's not enough power in it because not, our motivation isn't power enough. That's why vows are so powerful. We said this, like we talked about this last week, didn't we? We did talk about vows, didn't we? Yeah. So now any questions, please? Well, now let's discuss. Let's discuss. We've got 30 minutes left. Let's discuss. Okay, if you'd like to ask questions, if you want to unmute yourselves or write um, a question in the chat, if you feel too shy to ask, and we'll ask for you. Any other question? I'll be very specific. You can also use, put your hand up um, in the participants, or sometimes it's in the reactions button.
Yeah, Maddie, talk to me. It's Lou. I, the question oh, Lou, I have talk to is me. Um, the environmental consequences of karma. Yeah. If they were to be like reborn into a place where there's always hunger and the crops fail and everything else, yeah, yeah. Does that imply that everybody else who is living in that place yeah, well, yeah. has got the same karma? Oh, absolutely. There's no question. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's no question. Anybody who's got, you know, who gets rich, that's true. Absolutely. It's the fruit of generosity. You know, it's the oh, fruit wow. of generosity. But we have, see, we have collective karma. So, you know, um, yes, of course, those people, you might have met each other 47,000 lives ago. But you know, there's no, there's not a random grouping of people. You've got karma with those people, and you are all experiencing those. No, no, no. You see, not everybody. It depends. You some, some for sure. When it's when it's a polluted water, that that one river you all share. But you also do know, Lou, that some people are more fragile than others. So there could very well be a person who is born in a poor place due to, say, lack of generosity, but then also the, the food is polluted, the water is polluted, but they don't have much killing karma, so they, they don't mind the water. So, that's not, that's, so there is some karma there because there's more than one. It's not just the – if it's just the pollution – yeah, it doesn't mean everybody who's there gets that because some people, I mean, look at people who have an allergy to peanuts. There's one person among 10 million, isn't it, let's say, who if they eat a peanut, they die. So you're not sharing the karma in that case. But even if you are living in the where there's a polluted river, it could be variations of killing karma. Some people who just drink one mouthful will die. Others can drink it and get only a little bit sick. So there can be, a, you know, still could be a spectrum. But still, nevertheless, it's if you do get harmed by it, it is the result of a killing. That's why I always joke about Warren Buffett, you know, this mega rich fellow. I read his biography and his daughter said, I've never seen water pass his lips. He's famous for the most simple diet. His 90 years, or probably 80, 80, 88 years of his life, his meals, all his meals are vanilla ice cream, some flavoured Coca-Cola and um, cheeseburgers. That's it. And he's 90 and fit as a fiddle. So that means, I mean, many people, you know, you can, but you also know this. Some people um, die when they, you know, eat good food because they've got the karma to die. So that in those kind of cases, you know, Warren Buffett, what might make someone else obese and get, and get diabetes does not cause him that. So yes and no, both. But in general, there's collective karma, Lou, for sure. Do you understand? Yeah. Good. Thanks. Anybody else? We've got a question in chat, Venerable Rabina. Yes, good. Um, it says, if the fetus created the karma to be aborted, and then yep. you abort the fetus, when does the karma between the two of you finish? Isn't it harm upon harm upon harm? If you kill those who kill you, then what? Oh, yeah, of course. It, it stops when you change your mind. It stops when you do your part of it. When I decide I regret that and I, wouldn't, I vow to never do it again. And I've got karmic connection with that person. That's when it ends. I hope that answers the question. Anybody else, please? Any other question? Hello. Hello. Who's that? No, here, Gonzalo. Hello. Okay, Gonzalo, talk to me. Yes, um, I I wanted to ask about uh, the second of the four opponent powers, uh, yeah. reliance. Yes. Um, like, how, how should I think it? Should I first rely upon the Buddha, then rely upon the people? Uh, usually, I mean, I that's usually the way. The usual way we do it is you, you know, yeah, it would be that. Because the first thing you're thinking, once you've regretted it, turn to so of course it's the refuge comes first yes definitely can you hear that uh actually no i'm sorry the, okay. you you Start stopped again. for a for a minute like oh, it was sorry. stopped no, the video okay i don't so know my, if it's my internet or yours i'm but... sorry uh, are you hearing me properly you people or am i disappearing what Oh, so, okay, so listen, Gonzalo, the first step is you're going to, let's just use the analogy of sugar. You've acknowledged you've eaten sugar. Oh my God, what an idiot. I can't believe it. And then you think, whom can I turn to? Your very next step is, quick, where's the doctor? So of course, the refuge will be the first one. Do you understand? Mm. Yes. So I first think I rely upon the Buddha, and then I think uh, 
and I rely upon people. No, I mean, you, you, yeah, and then you know you visualize the Buddha you get, in this particular meditation. Mm -hmm. You'd imagine the Buddha looking like with Vajrasattva if you're familiar with it, and then you'd visualize that there, there, you know, the mind of your Lama is manifesting as Vajrasattva for your benefit. You might say a little prayer, but my feeling is I just delight that I found a doctor. I delight that I've got Buddha's teachings, you know, genuinely because I want to fix my my rubbish. Then the second one is you think think about the sentient beings you've harmed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Passion for those you've harmed you. Yeah. Clear? Yep. Thanks, yeah, Gonzalo. And, and, anyway, yeah. this is in the course notes. If you've got the course notes, it's all in there. This practice is all written out in the course notes. Mm -hmm. Did you get the PDF? Yes, yes, I got it. Any other question? Uh, I would like to ask one more question. Good, yes, Gonzalo. Um, about the question that that a person made before of uh, if you harm and then the people harm you and when That's does right. karma ends? That one. Uh, what happens if, for example, we have an intense karmic connection and you purify it, but yeah. I don't purify it? Well, I, I mean, I don't know to be exact, but we've got the karmic connection. Yeah, we've got. the company you will hate me you will not like me you'll want to harm me you know but because i've got i've cleaned up my part of it it won't affect me it won't harm me it won't hurt me mm. i mean it has to be something like that right you understand yeah yep thank you very much for your teachings Robina. that's the tragedy in our that's the tragedy in our culture when we believe totally as a scientific truth that you are the main cause of my suffering then of course i have to harm you back that's the first thing we have, this vindictive, and that's why it literally never ends. And that's where the tragedy of karma is. We go, go from life to life to life, not knowing we've had the past karma with each other, and we keep perpetuating it. This is the nightmare, you know, this is the utter nightmare. Is that hand up there for Maddie again? Is it, darling? Talk to me. Thank you, Venerable Rabina. Okay. I was wondering if there's any negative karma accumulated in um, changing gender. Well, what, you have to look at the motivation. It's the motivation, right? Completely. Exactly. I mean, in the end, Absolutely. whether you change, when you're not happy with your gender, and don't don't take this as insulting. If you're not happy with your gender or not happy with your handbag, it's the same thing. It's attachment. It's dissatisfaction. So I know that that isn't that would be seen as very shocking in the whole political movement of this because it sounds very cruel. Do you understand what I'm saying? I remember one person at a course heard me speak this way and was absolutely shattered like accusing them of being because you know we don't think we none of us think of it like this none of us thinking of getting a new husband or we think of it as just it's our right to get what we want and it's our right to decide what we should do it is our right we have the right but the bottom line is for the buddhist one we've got to see the motivation and 99 percent of the time darling everything we do is based on attachment but that's given that given that it's attachment given that a particular person is born in this life not dissatisfied with their husband but dissatisfied with their own body knowing that that's maybe your particular dissatisfaction then you recognize it as that and you maybe go ahead and turn into a girl or a boy whatever you want and then but try to do it with a pure motivation try to do it with bodhicitta otherwise everything's wasting time do you understand I absolutely do. Yes, thank you, Venerable. Okay, darling. Thanks. What else, people? Nothing. So the four-pointed powers are clear, are they? Huh? Oh, okay. I better talk something else then, hadn't I? How many more days have we got, Sarah? This is the we've got this is the third session of uh there's another four weeks there's another three weeks after this sorry oh we had six weeks all together did we yep my god on karma <laughs> i believe so i can't do it i'm done it i've finished it <laughs> <laughs> i'll just talk about something else it doesn't matter does it <laughs> no <laughs> i can repeat everything i mean I've, it's the trouble of talking too fast <laughs> Oh, there's some more questions. There's a question from lovely Cam Lowe in London. Good. Go you on, want Cam. to unmute yourself, Cam Lowe? Good, Cam. Go talk to me, sweetheart. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Venerable. Yes. Nice to see you. Happy uh, to see you. Uh, so I, I remember in one teaching you mentioned that um, it, the karma of stealing 
one of the results is that you feel poor. So you're not just experiencing poor. No, I'm lost you completely. You're going to have to start that sentence again. One can you hear? Time. What? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you okay. I didn't hear the words. So like, so the karma of taking the ungiven, for example. Oh, okay. Stealing. Yes, good. Now Stealing, I can hear. right? Um, so one of the uh, ripening results is not only that you experience being stolen from and being poor but also that you feel poor that yeah i think like, it's it seems pretty clear it's often with some people isn't it it's like that isn't it would you agree? I know, even if you have lots of even if you're comfortable and you live in a good house you still yeah, feel like you don't have yeah. enough possessions yeah. so which of the four which of the four ripening results would that well, be would that not, be environmental it's not, no it's not yeah it's 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 not i think that one is mainly I've got a feeling that that is more to do with attachment, being dissatisfaction. Okay. Because I mean, maybe it's more that than the stealing. Because dissatisfaction is whatever you've got, you're not happy. Mm. And, and that's the, I mean, whether it's to change, whether you're dissatisfied with the gender you've got, whether you're dissatisfied with the husband you've got, whether you're dissatisfied with the bank, the money in the bank, or whatever it might be, mm -hmm. you know, and that would be very strong attachment, uh, dissatisfaction from past attachment, as well as, uh, let me think. If you're very poor, you, I mean, also you see, you're very poor. Now, see, okay, there's two things there. There's two things, right? Exactly. There's the in, there's this, the tendency to to be mean. A person who feels they haven't got enough is a person who's miserly. A person, even if they don't have enough, they might have a generous attitude. They might still be cautious with their money and save every penny intent so the mental one the intent is the tendency similar to the cause not so much of it would be the tendency not to keep stealing no you might not have that but the tendency to uh fee to feel you haven't got enough that's attachment actually that's attachment and then again the strong way we identify ourselves well, that's ego grasping i am a poor person you understand so there's all that aspect I i'd say as well mm because it doesn't follow if you're if you're born poor which is experience similar to the cause of say lack of generosity or to, of stealing you can still have a mind that's very content and stories about poor people being generous and very happy and smiling friendly people so one is the mind Because everybody who doesn't have enough money isn't always miserly. So there's dissatisfaction is one thing, but being miserly is another. They're not the same. But the logic we have, because we blame the outside, we say, oh, well, all those people who steal, well, of course, the poor people, because they've got no money. That's not the logical reason a person steals. Lots of poor people don't steal. Lots of poor people aren't miserly. But we, we conflate those and, and we think that's the logical reason. No, it's not. Because rich people steal, you know. Mm. So there's the tendencies, and that next attachment, never satisfied, miserliness. That's the result of not giving. That's not so much the result of stealing. I think. I think mm -hmm. miserliness is not giving, not mm -hmm. wanting to give. Stealing, result of stealing, would be that you know, no matter how hard you work, you can never make ends meet. You never have enough to make things happen. Mm -hmm. trust you you know do you understand or you even get stolen from but not being generous which is miserliness that just means you know there's a, that's a different one isn't it they're different aren't they mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you mm. yep yes thank you good thanks thanks Cam. thank you so much that's very helpful okay we have another question from Catherine. if you'd like to unmute yourself Catherine. good darling talk to me thank you Rana well Ravina, for your teachings hello um i wanted to ask you about uh the four hours purification, presuming that that we're doing it well and our intentions are correct and our our resolve is kind of you know um, genuine and stuff. How yeah. how long does it take to kind of clean up our act, our past kind of you don't bad fully moment? purify until you realise emptiness. You can be in, I mean, that's what the thing about samsara. You can be in samsara for eons. You can, you can get brilliant generosity and the best compassion in the world. You'll be born as, a, as the highest God realm. You'll be born as the richest, most successful, most divine human. But you won't clean up 
the karma finally until you have cut the root of it. So the purification process is like this radical weeding. You're not pulling the seeds out of the root. That doesn't happen yeah. to you with emptiness. But you can, on a conventional level, like if you and I have got this bad relationship, each of us working on our own mind, we can clean it up, you know, and next life will give, us, give each other a hug. So we've cleaned up the relative level. Right. But until we've removed ego grasping from the mind, we've still got the tendency to, to do the. It's a huge, it's like there's great levels of practice. You know, the very first level is just get rid of, you know, put atomic bombs under the weeds, live in vows. Then you go to the next level and you start to work on the delusions, attachment, and then you weaken it even more strongly. Then you get to add bodhicitta to the mix and you've got outrageous. And then finally you realize emptiness. So it's level at stages and level. Does that make sense? Can yes. You? Yes. Thank you. You sure? Yeah. Sound doubtful. I keep. I would, so okay. you. The connection is a little bit. Oh, dodgy. okay. Sorry. All right. So then. good. Um. But yeah, I think I broadly got that. So presumably purifying, as well as, as well as getting rid of some of the stuff. Obviously, not the kind of roots. Um. Presumably, it, it helps get rid of some of the obstacles to practice and to moving ahead. <laughs> Of, of, of cleaning up your garden, getting, removing, putting atomic bombs under the weeds, giving space for the virtues to grow. You know, that's why we've got to do the main first, the first level of morality in ethic, in Buddhism is the, the morality of refraining from harming because that's the most heavy. So we've got to stop planting more negative seeds and purify the seeds that are already there. Get ahead of the game. And then you get to work on your mind and you, you do even more profound work. And then you get to the body suffer path and you've got, you add piles and piles. It. And then you can finally get the root out by realizing emptiness in the six perfections. Thank you. Talk about, it, I'm sure. So, um, we have this is time. often very. Sorry, everyone, you you froze then for uh, it keeps saying your net with your bandwidth is low and you you froze. So sorry. It... We we do have another yeah. question in the chat. If that's okay. Well done. Absolutely, come to me. Yeah. But so the yeah, question yeah. says. Can you please explain how to see the deity when you practice if it is not prayer? If it's not what? Prayer. What's prayer? Oh. <laughs> prayer. P R A Y E R. Prayer. Or oh, prayer. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, darling. I'm not from your part of the world. My Australian accent. Prayer. No, no, it's so funny. America, they just. There's a friend of mine who's a man who's called Don, and there's a friend of mine who's a woman who's called... There you go, well, like, like, so I can't hear sometimes some words, you know. Okay, <laughs> never mind, prayer. So I start the question again. Um, can you please explain how to see the deity when you practice if it is not prayer? If it is not prayer. Yeah. I, I, that, that part I don't know. I don't know what that means, but I'll say the first, I'll answer the first part. So it's like, the point is, it's us using the visualization of the Buddha as a tool to help me purify my mind. So I visualize the Buddha, Vajrasattva, and then I visualize, first of all, Buddha sends nectar that fills me completely and I just, you use you're using this visualization of Buddha to help you purify your mind. Buddha's not purifying your mind. You are. So you're visualizing the Buddha. You know, this relationship, we do, especially in the Vajrayana Buddhism, which is the basis of the Mahayana in Tibet, you try to cultivate a relationship with the Buddha, to open the heart, to have some devotion, you know. That, that, so there's just a tool. The guru is a tool you're using. The Buddha, the guru, the Buddha, visualizing above, is a tool that you're visualizing the Buddha. You... Yeah. 
put all the imprints of everything you've ever done and said that's negative. Then you visualize purifying the speech. Then you visualize purifying the mind. It's just a tool you're using. You know what I mean? You're doing the work. I don't know if that makes sense. And the point is, I mean, in this path, we're developing relationship with the Buddha. Maybe that's foreign to some of us, you know. We're trying to open the heart, have devotion. So if you've got a Lama, a person who you have decided is your spiritual teacher, that really means who is the person that you have decided is the Buddha for you, then it makes it very personal just to imagine. Music teacher, you're practicing music and you've got a music teacher. You love your music teacher. No, no, you are, but you're thinking of your music teacher. You're imagining your music teacher. We need this. It helps us. You do the practice. If you're, you've got a therapist, you know, you're thinking of your therapist all the time, telling you, giving you advice. You're, it's your mind. You're just using this therapist to help you get clearer about your misery. So we all, because we all, we, are, we all need love, as Lama Yeshi says. We're all dying for love, Lama Yeshi put it. It's so sweet. So devotion is a really crucial quality to, to develop eventually, you know, because it means an open heart. And when your heart is open, you're receptive. And so things can happen. Things can change. When the mind is deluded and negative and separate, then we're kind of, everything's cold, you know. So it's got many functions. But it's not as if you're praying to the Buddha to, to, to purify you. I mean, you could even visualize. Your mind thinking those thoughts and it's your mind that is doing the purification i hope that helps i hope that helps it's a very good question thank you so maybe just a few minutes left three minutes frankly we, we got no it's not two hours it's 90 minutes the class isn't it okay Sarah? Sarah? Yeah. Hello. 90 minutes. Is it 90 um, minutes? Class? I think, I believe so. I believe it was okay. yeah, 6.32. Let me just talk a little bit quickly. Why is it? Why is it that until we realize emptiness, we don't cut the root of it all? Because everything that we do that's negative, even everything we do that's positive right now, is based on the assumption of an intrinsic self. So as long as we keep doing attachment, keep doing anger, keep doing this, keep doing that, we are sustaining the intrinsic self. And Buddha happens to be telling us that there is no such self. So as long as we keep believing in the lie, the seed, you know, then we will continue to do negative actions and continue to do harm. But once you've cut the root of believing in the intrinsic I, there's nothing to be attached to. There's nothing to be angry about. It, it, the whole the whole the whole system collapses in other words a psychological logic to it which initially is not evident to us until we've studied a bit you know so we just think we think 90 minutes we've been here if we get these four steps really clear really understand regret is kindness to ourselves acknowledging the dumb things we've done because i don't want the suffering then we turn to the Buddha as our as our doctor, be delighted to have a doctor, rely upon the doctor to use his methods so I can heal myself. Then we have compassion for those we've harmed. And if we can have compassion for those who've harmed us, because they're going to suffer terribly in the future, then we do the imagining purification. Then we do the, and then the fourth one, oh, sorry, I didn't finish the fourth step. And the fourth one, resolve, you decide, I did sort of, I d you decide, I will never kill again, I'll never, or I won't badmouth Tim for the next 10 minutes or something. You make us realize that you're in charge, you're in charge, you're in charge, not some victim of circumstance. That's the essence of it. And as long as says we're insane not to do it every day. So this combined with living in vows, you can sit back and relax. You have the best tools on the planet, I tell you. Okay, precious ones. May body chi to grow and grow hearts of all. Jung chub, sem chub, rinpo che, ma ke pa nam ke gu chi ke pa nyam pa me pa yang. Gong ne gong du pa ba shog. And all these seeds we planted in these 90 minutes, may they may we nourish them from this moment forward so they do manifest as our Buddhahood as quickly as possible so we can benefit to sentient beings. That's it.
And I'll see you very soon. Thank you, sweetheart. Thank you, Venerable Rubina. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much, so Venerable oh, Rubina. Thank, Thank you, Venerable Rubina. Thank you, Kenny Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Still, people? Thank you. Thank you. Now you can hear me. Oh, good. Thank you. All Thank froze. Thank you. Bye, darlings. Thank you. Bye. Bye.